Hello and welcome back. Welcome to the MBLEX review course. My name is Jody Skulls. I'm your instructor and I am so happy to be with you today. Uh, today we're going to be talking about navigating the body and we are taking a new approach. Uh, this is the, the start. I like to say this is where we all start our journey in reviewing for the emblex because unless we can navigate the body, meaning know the names of the movements of the body, know the anatomical positions of the body, um, then we, we are lost. It is very difficult to figure out client assessment questions if we don't have our foundation in understanding the terminology uh, of navigating the body. So today that's what we're gonna be doing. Uh, and we are going to, let's see, I want to just go ahead and get started. Yes. And so I like to, um, I like to go over, uh, three different parts of, of this class. I like to spend a few minutes in the start of the class, giving you some test taking strategies. And, uh, and then we move into part two, which is the learning and part three, which is dissecting questions. Uh, and so feel free to fast forward if you wanna go ahead and just get right to the learning. Um, however, I will tell you the truth. You can have all the knowledge in your head. Many of you already do. Many of you already know enough, enough knowledge, enough learning, enough material, enough data, enough anatomy, enough client assessment, enough physiology, enough kines, enough of the laws and regulations. You already know enough to pass. But some have all that knowledge and still don't pass. And the reason is because we've never been taught to take a test. If you do not have a strategy around taking this test, you can have an encyclopedia in your brain and can still end up failing this test because of the format of the test. And so that is why we spend a few minutes covering test taking strategies. And so Today, I wanna to remind you of a test taking strategy, which is to do meaningful homework. And look, I've, taught, I've worked with hundreds of students now, hundreds of graduates now, and about 600 graduates now have been through this program. And many of them tell me, oh my God, I don't know what to study. And you know, there's a lot to study. I've, I've given you the MBLEX content outline in fact, I'll fill, I'll post, I'll uh, tag it again uh, in this particular uh, class. But the content outline gives you the content. But to do meaningful homework, you can't just crack open a book and start reading. There really needs to be a strategy around doing meaningful homework. It's part of the reason you're here listening to this class. Because I can pull for you what are the most important things to know. This week we had a question on Jody, do I have to study non-Western philosophy, anatomy, uh, physiology? Do I have to study the non-Western stuff? So really the Eastern um, body work modalities. We used to have to be able to, but you don't anymore. We don't have to do history of massage and we don't have to know details about Chinese medicine. However, according to the content outline, you do need to know your body work modalities. And so coming back to that content outline allows you to navigate what you need to study. So when I say knowing body work modalities, what do I mean? What I mean is that you do need to know what Reiki is. You need to know acupuncture is. You do need to know the chakra system. I know it's energy work, but there are certain things you need to know that are that are intrinsic to body work. So people we will refer to. 
not necessarily within the scope of our practice unless we have another certification. You need to know what cupping is. You need to know what dry needling is. These are different body work modalities that we may refer to chiropractic care. You need to know what a doc who a doctor of osteopathy is and how they're different from a traditional medical doctor. You'll need to know what a naturopath is or be familiar. You don't need to know all the ins and outs, but you do need to know other body work modalities according to the content outline. This is part of what we could be tested on, on the Emblex. So that comes back to doing meaningful homework and letting the content outline provided by the Federation of State Massage Therapy Boards, provided by that Federation, that is our blueprint on what to study. And so I suggest that you take a category, there's seven categories, and I, I suggest you take one category per week. So start with A and P, anatomy and physiology, study that for a week even if you only get one hour once a week. So the point is that there is resources. There's this resource for you to do meaningful homework. There's the Federation's content outline to guide you to do meaningful homework. And then there's your own strategies that you can come up with to make sure, okay, oh, Joe, I tested low in A, in a and P. I need to study more than just an hour on A&P, A&P being anatomy and physiology. Great. You know even better than I do. Many of you have already um, been through um, a, a one time taking two times, 10 times taking the Emblex. Um, and so you kind of know, okay, I, I got a score I tested low here, or maybe your practice exams are giving you where you're, you need improvement. You can customize your strategy to make sure you're doing meaningful homework because it can be an endless pit of studying, right? Yeah. All right. So that is my uh, test taking strategy for you today in your preparation for the exam uh, that in doing so, you do meaningful homework. Okay. Oh, let's do this and we'll do this. All right, you guys ready to move into some learning? I will address some of these uh, questions uh, in the chat um, when we get to the Q&A. All right, let's move into some learning. And today, like I mentioned, we're talking about navigating the body. Oh, Lord, you guys, sorry. I have to make sure that all of our little technology here is going to work for me. I got to share with sound. Okay. Because we have some video. We have some extra video today. All right. Thanks for your patience. And here we go. So wanted to mention that some of the images I'll be using today have been used with permission uh, from Trail Guide to the Body. Uh, and where uh, necessary, I have given credit uh, to where my images have come from. So welcome to Navigating the Body, the foundational learning that you'll need to build on from here. So when you build a foundation of a house, it's the thing that comes first, right? And so we're gonna build the house from here, but we have to have that strong foundational learning. And so all of our learning starts from anatomical position. And if you've watched some of the Navigating the Body, we have several Navigating the Body uh, classes on the patron site and even a few on the YouTube site. Um, this is some new material. There are some repeat material because we have some brand new graduates who've joined us. And so this is the series that starts our eight or nine week cycle. And I always start with navigating the body. So we all are starting from anatomical position. Anatomical position is the, is the origin of all of our questions 
on anatomy, physiology, movement, kinesiology. So as you see here, the person, white female, um, standing erect, feet facing forward, palms facing forward, arms by her side. This is anatomical position. When we have a question about movement, we start from this position and then we start from anatomical position and then. Let's review a couple of terms that are common to anatomy, physiology, and kinesiology questions and some client's assessment questions on the Amblex. Proximal and distal. We see this on the long limbs of the body, mostly proximal and distal refer to long bones of the body. So we know we have a long bone in the upper arm. We have long bones. Long bones simply mean they're longer than they are wide. That's the definition of a long bone. So longer than they are wide. So proximal is closer to the midline of the body. Higher, closer to the midline of the body. Distal often is lower, but away from the midline of the body. Farther out. Proximal, closer in, typically up. Distal, further out. So the fingers are distal to the shoulder. While the shoulder is proximal to the fingers. Where are the toes compared to the hip? Let's take a peek in the chat and see what we have. The toes are blank to the hip. Very good, Vanessa. No question mark needed. Yes, Sandra. Yes, the toes are distal to the hip. Farther away. And I see why maybe the question mark, because are they closer to the midline of the body? But traditionally, this is upper and lower, right? Proximal and distal, upper and lower. So the hip is proximal to the toes. Farther away, up. We have different regions of the body and you've, you've, um, you're familiar with some, but let's walk through the cranial region, the cervical region refers to our spine. The middle of the back is the thoracic region, the lumbar region. We need to know these different regions of the spine, cervical, thoracic, and lumbar. We cannot just say the spine. We need to refer to what part of the spine. Many of the questions on your emblex will re refer to these regions of the spine. And so when we see those names, like the thoracic region of the spine, we know what part of the body they're talking about. So we've got this, the sacral, the pelvic region. The pelvic region refers to that whole basin. We've got the gluteal region, the popliteal region. You may have to dust off a couple brain cells to see that. Popliteal region is the soft part behind the knee. And it is important because it's considered an endangerment site. That's the only reason we have to know popliteal. We don't work on the soft part behind the knee. You can work on the lateral knee, but not on the soft part of the popliteal region. It's an endangerment site. On the right side, we see the pectoralis region, the axillary region, armpit, axillary region. This is our brachial region because of the brachial plexus. We've got a cubital, the elbow. We've got the antecubital. Antecubital, also, the only reason you need to know it, 
endangerment site. We don't work on the soft part. Can I show you the soft part? If you put your finger in there, that soft part of the of the elbow, we don't work there. You can work the outside parts of the elbow. That's what we've talked about when we talk about working tennis and golfer's elbow. Yeah, so it's great to work the outside parts of the elbow, but not that soft part, the antecubital part. Palmer region, dorsal region of the hand also is here in our picture, the palmer region, the dorsal region of the hand. Let me see, I was practicing some cupping. Do you see that? <laughs> I got some new cups and I've been practicing. Uh, all right, and then moving down the regions of the body, we've got the femoral region, pubic region, obviously inguinal, um, but the femoral region has to do with the femur. So the femur is in the low leg, patellar region, and then the dorsal region. Dorsal uh, region of the foot and the palmar region of the, of the hand, but it's the plantar region of the foot on the bottom of the foot. Think about if you step on a plant, that's the plantar region. Plantar fasciitis on the bottom of the foot. And we remember that dorsal um, region. Maybe you've heard of the dorsal fin of a dolphin or the dorsal fin of a shark. Baby shark, a shark, a shark, a baby shark, a shark, a shark, shark. Right? Okay. <laughs> the dorsal fin. That's how think of the dorsal fin on the top of your foot. That's the dorsal plane, the dorsal region of the foot. All right. I believe I'm going to go over a bit of the brachial plexus right now since all of that is circled. <laughs> yes. All right. Uh, the brachial region. Okay, there's a lot going on up in here. This is the brachial, it says right there, but that's kind of where the brachial plexus goes. This is considered the brachial region because it includes the scalene muscles. So the region is here, but the plexus, the brachial plexus is a nerve bundle. It's the yellow here in our screen. Plexus, nerve bundle brachial region where that nerve bundle lives. And that nerve bundle is partly, partially our scalenes, right? Uh, clavicle is one of the anatomical boundaries. Uh, in fact, the brachial plexus goes under the clavicle and under the clavicle and under the first rib, it's right in there. But you'll see the, the muscles involved with the brachial plexus, the pectoralis minor, is a big one. Subscap contributes. And even though this looks like a great big muscle, this is pec minor. So the brachial plexus goes under the clavicle, but over the first rib. And that's where the impingement can happen of those nerves. When the muscles get tight, so say pectoralis minor, technically pectoralis minor is kind of like your, your if you were wearing a vest and you stuck your thumbs behind the armholes of the vest, you see this sometimes on NFL, the guys will stick their hands in here. But right in here is pec minor. And when pec minor gets tight, it shortens and it creates less space between the clavicle and the first rib. And sometimes that brachial plexus can be impinged. And impinged just means pinched. And so signs of that are pain, numbness, tingling down the arm. Now pain, numbness, and tingling down the arm can mean a lot of things. Not everybody has a, a, a brachial plexus impingement. I mean, heck, if it's down your left arm, it could be a heart attack, right? Left arm, one of the signs of a heart attack. Arm numbness can also be a sign of a TIA, which is a, a mini stroke, TIA. But this is the anatomy of the brachial region, the brachial plexus. We're not going to diagnose. We're going to assess when a client tells us they have pain, numbness, or tingling down the arm. And the very first thing we're going to assess for is that they're not having a heart attack or a stroke. But we can treat this region here to open this region 
to have favorable effects down the arm. Can you imagine by lengthening the pectoralis minor muscle, opening up some space between the clavicle and the first rib, how that might take some pressure off that nerve bundle? That's the concept. Yeah, that's why sometimes we work a region here to help relieve pain here. We're gonna go into a little bit more detail, a lot more detail of some of these terms, but let's review. The planes of the body, we've got the sagittal plane, so the sagittal plane divides us left and right. The transverse plane is a horizontal plane and typically through the middle of the body. Transverse plane through the umbilicus, up and down. Now, you, we might say anterior, excuse me, we might say superior and inferior, but that depends on the question. The transverse plane does give us superior versus inferior. So upper versus lower. And then of course the frontal plane, sometimes called the coronal plane, but the frontal plane simply front from back. If you see coronal plane, think of having a crown placed on the head. When you bow down, that crown might fall off. The frontal plane, the coronal plane. Mm -hmm. it, yes. All right, here anatomically is the clavicle and the umbilicus. Um, and we're looking at the terms superior and inferior, as well as cranial and caudal. We also have the terms dorsal and ventral. Now, some of these terms actually appear more in veterinary medicine, but I want you to be clear on what they are. Cranial, towards the cranium, right? Caudal is away from there, but towards the tail, the tail bone. So take a look, come up. So directional terms give us, let me make sure you can see this, yeah. Um, give us how to relate. So superior sometimes is cranial. It's towards the head, superior, cranial, towards the head up. So the hand is, uh, um, oops, the hand is superior to the knees is what that should say. The hand is superior, hand is part of, no, it's not part of anything, it's superior to the knees. But away from the head is caudal. So inferior and caudal could be similar. Typically caudal refers to the tailbone or the tail end. Like say, for example, um, a uh, in in the womb, the baby in the womb, that fetus will have a cranial and a caudal part of their spine. So we, we see it used more for tail, but also inferior. Just want you to be familiar. And then likewise, um, these are anatomical terms that are a little bit interchangeable anterior towards the front here could also be considered ventral. And then posterior could also be considered dorsal. Now we've got a dorsal region of our foot, but again, we're interpreting the question, right? This comes from the chambers of the heart. So this ventricle, this ventral, it's because our heart is more anterior. I know sometimes that's a little confusing because we've got ventricles in our heart, right? But the ventral side is the anterior side. Let me be clear on what the ventricles are. So we have four chambers of the heart. 
So the top two chambers are the atrium. If you've ever been to an event at a fancy hotel or maybe even to a stadium and you got seats in the atrium, they were up there, right? So those are the top two chambers of the heart, the atrium. But the bottom two chambers are the ventricles, not the ventral, that is the front of the body. The ventricles are two chambers, the lower two chambers of the heart. Let's also look at this as far as the dorsal and the ventral. So we're back to, we're away from the heart now, but there is a relation to the heart. And I just want to let you know where it came from. Um, the back side of the heart is called the dorsal side. It lives near the vertebrae, right? So it's on the back side of the heart. The front side of the heart is called the ventral side. And so you may hear about procedures where they had a ventral procedure that went through the anterior. So that ventral surface of the heart faces forward. And so you'll see here, this is also considered the ventral cavity. And we have different cavities in our body, right? This is considered the dorsal cavity, that whole back side, it's called the dorsal cavity. We've got a cranial cavity, the spinal cavity. And this just means, cavity usually just means the, the, the holding space. I would say the hole, but it's not really a hole because it's filled with stuff. But the cavity, like when you look at a cave, there's a cavity in that cave that allows us to go in. So we've got a thoracic cavity in the abdominal cavity is where is our stomach and our large intestines and our small intestine and our duoden, all of our um, organs of digestion are in the abdominal cavity, as well as other things, our liver, our spleen. Um, and then we've got the pelvic cavity. And there's a little in-between space here, but don't worry about that so much. Just know the big ones. So the cavities are where that organ lives, but there is a dorsal cavity on the dorsal side of the body, which is the back versus the dorsal surface of our foot, which is like baby shark. Oh, there we go. I like this. Vanessa says things come in through the, through the vents, the frontal, the ventral front, and leave through the back door, the dorsal. That's a lovely way to remember that. Excellent. Thank you for that, Vanessa. So things come in through the vents, through the front, the ventral side, and leave through the back door, the back door, which is the dorsal. So I just wanted to be super clear about those regions and cavities and, and surfaces of the body. Let's take a closer look at our rotator cuffs and the scapula. And some movements at the glenohumeral joint. Yay! And you learned this stuff. It just may, it may not have stuck. So it'll look familiar, but there'll be some new things. So fair warning. All right. This is a picture of a scapula. Yes. And so the infraspinatus, so we have four rotator cuff muscles. Jot in the chat, where's the chat? Jot here. Sits. Yeah, there you go. Yes, Sensei, write it down. Give it to everybody. So what are the four? What are the, what is the acronym? You'll remember it once you hear it. A bunch of you are gonna stick it in the chat. Don't type in the chat if you're driving. Don't type in the chat if you have to concentrate on other things. I'll tell you what's in the chat. But the infraspinatus is one of our rotator cuffs and it arises from, it lives in this infraspinatus fossa. There we go, Paige has got them, Paige is, yeah, exactly. And the acronym, as Ensley said, is SITS. And Paige just gave them to us in the chat. Uh, we're gonna talk first about the eye in SITS, the infraspinatus. And that comes from an area, that lives right here under the spine of the scapula, 
and it's called the infraspinatus. And you'll see here another one of the S. So we have S I T S. Yes. Yep, you got it. Very good. Those are supraspinatus, lives here, uh, lives supra. It lives above the supra. If that was going to have a, you're going to think about this in just a moment, but it lives above the spine of the scapula right here. And the infraspinatus lives in this infraspinatus fossa that's just under that ridge on the scapula called the spine of the scap. It makes a nice little, little cave, if you will, not quite a cave, but a little lean to, if you will, for the infraspinatus. And the supraspinatus, oh, I may have given you the answer. The supraspinatus is responsible for elevation so, so is the levator scapula, right? The levator, the elevator, elevation of the scapulas. Go ahead and elevate your scapulas. That's moving the superior border of the scap and the acromion process up. So the acromion process goes all goes up. So we get that little pointy point on the acromion process. And then depression is down, moving those scapulas down. So down, and a lot of times they go in, right? So we might. We might do a, an exercise where they say, pinch your scapulas. That is not depression of the scapula. Pinching, pinching moves towards the spine, right? If you pinch your scapulas together, if you move them in a pinching motion towards each other, towards the spine, could that be medial? Could that be medial movement? Yes, we're going to cover that in just a moment, but it's not elevation and it's not depression. Our scapulas, they move, man. There's a scapula thoracic joint that's not even really a joint, but your scapula just glides along your thoracic ribs, right? There's no real joint to the scapula at the ribs, but that scapula thoracic joint we'll see in just a moment. Let's finish with the rotator cuffs. The supraspinatus elevates the shoulder. So it elevates the shoulder and it elevates the joint out to the side. Levator is the major mover of elevation of the, show, of the, of the scapula. So, and supraspinatus helps to elevate, but it also helps to move that shoulder joint, the scapula is going out. Infraspinatus internally rotates the shoulder joint. Let's pause there for just a moment and take a look at what internal and external rotation looks like. Because you may get this question on the Emblex and it's a little confusing. So the movement of internal rotation, let's do this with a bent elbow. Keep your elbow by your side. Before you move, think about where is your humerus? So I've got a bent elbow right here, yeah? Humerus is here, head of the humerus here. So here's the head of the humerus. And so based on anatomical position, when we internally rotate, we internally rotate. That is internally rotating the head of the humerus. So, Where's my little ball? I thought I had my ball here. Okay, so the, the head of that humerus is internally rotating. So if my finger is here, hope that makes sense. So the internal rotation compared to the external rotation. Again, elbow by your side. Head of the humerus is at the top of the humerus. So this whole head of the humerus. But I'm gonna use one point to demonstrate. External rotation. You see how that's moving externally. External rotation of the head of the humerus. That's how you know what direction they're talking about. Shoulder, glenohumeral joint that is a loose ball and socket. 
And we're going to see more about this anatomy in just a moment, but to understand the direction that they're talking about. So the head of the humerus moving internally, internal rotation. Head of the humerus moving externally, external rotation. Uh, and and, and infraspinatus assists in externally the rotating the shoulder. And you'll see here in um, Trail Guide to the Body, they call it lateral rotation of the shoulder. So external rotation makes sense to me. I just wanted to show you that that same movement could be considered lateral rotation. And it says, show the video. Okay, let me show you the video. Let me move to the video. Share with sound. And this was a nice little 20 second external shoulder rotation and neutral. Stand straight, eyes level, set shoulder blades down and back, keep elbows at 90 degrees, wrist straight and forearm parallel to the ground. All right, I'm going to watch it one more time. Shoulder external rotation and neutral. neutral. Stand straight, eyes level, set shoulder blades down and back, keep elbows at 90 degrees, wrist straight and forearm parallel to the ground. External rotation of the head of the humerus. This is a little bit different, a little bit different position. This is internal rotation. Shoulder internal rotation at 90 degrees. Raise arm just below parallel. Stand straight, eyes level. Set the shoulder blade. And we did this exercise with the elbow at our side. So just want you to be familiar that it can go either way. So this is considered at 90 degrees. Next to your side is considered neutral. All right, let's resume. Okay. <laughs> Oh, so we know the infraspinatus helps with external rotation of the shoulder joint, the glenohumeral joint. Take a few guesses. That's not, there's only one rotator cuff that, that helps with internal rotation. But what other muscles, if you were going to guess what muscles internally rotate the shoulder? So internal rotation, we did it like this, right? internal rotation of the shoulder. Give me one muscle you think is involved. One or two, you wanna take a guess? You wanna make an assessment? You wanna poke around at your own shoulder? Well, I like it, I like a deltoid, I like a deltoid. What do you feel right away? So if you put your elbow next to your side, bring your fist towards your belly. What's activating? I hear you, yes. They're all saying pecs. Yes. So anterior deltoid, pec major. The lats actually assist, but the subscapularis, by the way, the subscapularis, we will show you where that is located, um, but it's the strongest of the rotator cuffs. And another muscle that internally rotates the shoulder is teres major. So all of those are, um, those muscles are involved. Hopefully you'll never see that question on the emplex. Um, but it's good to know what's involved so you know what's not involved, okay? Don't ask me how the lats help, but I, yeah. Yeah, this is the stuff I struggle with too. I know, I, it's because all these muscles are involved. Can't we just pick two? Can we just pick two? and say the major movers of the internal rotation of the shoulder. Meh. Unfortunately, all of these guys are, in, are involved. And so what that helps us with, you know, and, and to be honest, I don't expect you to memorize this. I share it with you because as you're treating your clients, if they have pain with internal rotation of the shoulder, you're not just gonna treat the anterior delt. 
You're going to treat the subscap. You're going to treat the pec major. You're going to loosen up the lats. The lats. You're going to look at treating the teres minor and teres major. So you're going to treat that whole, you're going to holistically approach that shoulder, right? And this is why, because they're all involved. All right, let's move along. Move along, move along. I'm going to post another video of rotator cuff anatomy. Um, in fact, I'll, I'll tease you with just a little bit of it. Um, I'll tease you with just one minute of it. Um, and hopefully I'm gonna just stop the share for a moment because sometimes the it gets a little wonky when I switch screens, so. Mm -hmm. Here's just two minutes. And this is the video that I'll post in the patron site. Um, it's, from, uh, it's from YouTube. Hi, this is Peter from Anatomy Zone, and in this tutorial, we're going to take a look at the anatomy of the rotator cuff. The rotator cuff are a group of four small muscles within the shoulder, which originate from the scapula and attach to the humerus to provide dynamic stability at the glenohumeral or shoulder joint. These muscles are found deep within the shoulder so here you can see the pectoralis major, deltoid, trapezius, and latissimus dorsi muscle, which are some of the large muscles involved in moving our shoulder. Underneath these, we can find the rotator cuff muscles. So our shoulder joint is made up of the head of the humerus, which sits within the shallow glenoid fossa. At any one time, there is only about one third of that humeral head sitting in the glenoid fossa. This configuration allows lots of mobility of the joint, but in return, the shoulder joint sacrifices stability. To regain stability, we have four rotator cuff muscles, which can be remembered by the acronym SITS, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and on the anterior surface of the scapula, the subscapularis. All right, I'm gonna pause there uh, because it's the, when he starts to talk, I want you to be able to replay that video if you'd like, um, because the anterior surface, anterior surface of the scapula, oh my, right? Where are we? There we go. So the anterior surface of the scapula hmm. Sorry, I'm on my wrong screen. So think about your shoulder blades laying on your back. Where your shoulder blades lay on the back, that forms something called the scapulothoracic joint. I mentioned earlier, it's not really a joint, but because it glides against your ribs in the thoracic region, it's called the scapulothoracic joint. So your shoulder blades are laying on your rib cage. Just think about them right now. They're laying on your rib cage. Go like this, if these are your shoulder blades. And so your knuckles, are posterior. Shoulder blades, the palm side, if this was my shoulder blade, the palm side would be anterior. You following me? Shoulder blades sit on our back, on our ribs, the scapula thoracic joint. Our knuckles point towards the posterior, the dorsal, right? the posterior. But what he just said was the subscapularis lives on the anterior surface of the scapula. So it's under the scapula, but because of where the scapula 
sits. It's considered the anterior surface. Following me? Okay. Can be a little confusing. I thought I was sharing. Okay, let's stop there. Share here. Mm -hmm. No, where are we? There we are. Okay. Sorry, it's just words, no pictures. So there's that video of the rotator cuff. He talked about the anatom the anterior side of your scapulas. That was originally very confusing to me because the subscapularis, like sub, right? Down, under, but it's considered the anterior side of that scapula. All right, here we go. Just for review, the movements of the scapula, and that would be elevation, Adduction or retraction. So adduction adding to the me medial part of the spine, that's the pinch, adduction, medial. Well, it's retraction, but towards the middle. We've got adduction of the scapula. So if you throw a punch, some, some books will call it protraction, but usually abduction of the scapula. We're talking of the scapula now, okay? We're not talking about abduction of the arm. We're not talking about abduction of the leg, the femur, different bones. Be very careful on your emblex question, what bone they're talking about. And again, this is how you spell that scapula thoracic joint. So abduction of the scapula would be moving away from the midline of the body. So that medial border of the scap here either moves towards or away from the midline of the body. We've got deep elevation and depression there. And then we do have upward rotation and downward rotation of the scapulas. But if you're getting those type of questions, eliminate a few wrong answers and move on because those are a little bit more tricky. Let's move to the ribs for just a moment. We only have a few more slides. Uh, and I wanted to mention that there's movement in the rib cage. Our rib cage moves. When we breathe, when we inhale, our rib cage expands, but it also elevates. So our rib cage expands. That makes sense, right? We're breathing in air. We need to get more space in there. The question here on this page is what muscles move the rib cage? What muscles open up the ribs? There's muscles in between those ribs. So we take an inhale in, expand. As we exhale out, the ribs collapse and they depress, they go down. We breathe out. I see an answer has come in. Yes, Ensley was the first to say the intercostal muscles. Yes, those intercostal muscles live in between our ribs. They help with the expansion and elevation of the rib cage. And here's a nice little point on the benefits of massage for respiration, for the respiratory system. When we glide our fingers in between, like say from the vertebrae out, so cl client is in prone position, their face down. And we track and go in between the ribs. Posterior, in between the ribs, posterior. Can you imagine how that might warm up the intercostal muscles? It allows for a nicer expansion in the rib cage. Thereby, by increasing the mechanical action, we're able to take a deeper breath. And if you haven't already done so, just take a deep breath. Yeah. 
Yeah, just pause here for a moment. Covering a lot of ground today. Our rib cage expands, but it expands this way. It expands laterally. It expands front to back, anterior to posterior, and it even expands up and down. So three dimensions of breathing. Nice. One last review on the movements of the glenohumeral joint. And we saw the glenoid fossa, humerus, glenohumeral joint right here, that fallen socket that is the shoulder. We want to review flexion and extension of the shoulder joint. Flexion of the shoulder joint. Extension of the shoulder joint. Let me change. There we go. Right. So flexion of the shoulder joint. Extension of the shoulder joint. We've got adduction. Got coming back in. So adduction coming towards the midline of the body, adduction away from the midline of the body. See the little red arrows here? And you'll be able to track the movement. Medial rotation. Lateral rotation. We called it internal and external rotation, internal rotation, external rotation. In the horizontal plane, so many things, right? We have to be so careful. In the horizontal plane, see this long arm? Horizontal adduction. Horizontal abduction. Horizontal on the horizon, remember we've got vertical and horizontal. So on the horizontal plane, horizontal adduction, horizontal abduction. And one final review of movements of the body. We've got two, two more slides on this before we move into dissecting our questions. Uh, and so here, this is movements of the spine. So if you're feeling overwhelmed, that's normal. If you're not feeling overwhelmed, bonus. Movements of the body, here's the category, spine, spine and thorax. So spine and thorax, and we're looking at flexion of the spine. So basically, if you're sitting in a chair, flexing your spine, well, keeping your butt. So flexing your spine, keeping your butt in place. Extension of the spine. Be careful that you're not moving at your hips. This is flexion of the spine. And this is actually important for body mechanics. Let me pause here so I can make sure you can see me. Okay, yes. So flexion of the spine, they're showing seated, but flexion of the spine. So remember, this is hips, this is spine. Flexion of the spine, hips don't move. Rib cage comes closer to the pelvis. The movement is just here, flexion of the spine. Very bad for body mechanics. Rib cage, touch your ribs, touch your hips. No movement at the hips. Body mechanics, we must pivot at the hip. Pivot at the hip. Flexion at the hip. No, the, the spine tilts, but flexion of the spine is in the spine. It's almost like when you do a crunch, right? So if you just do a crunch, if you've ever done sit-ups, um, you'll do a crunch. Let's go back to the crunch. So he's doing a crunch. Doesn't look like it. Looks like he's doing a sit-up. But a sit-up is movement through the hip joint. A crunch 
is flexion of the spine. All right, extension of the spine, rotation of the spine, lateral flexion of the spine. Remember, we, you're gonna see lateral flexion of the neck, right? Lateral flexion of the neck happens in the neck. Lateral flexion of the spine happens in the spine. And we have flexion and extension of the neck. We have rotation of the neck, rotation of the head, rotation of the neck. So I point this out so that you start to distinguish what body part are they asking you about? You know these answers. You know them in many parts of the body. Just have to identify and be clear what body part are they asking you about? We'll look at uh, adduction and abduction of the legs. We're not gonna go into the cock, so we don't have time for this. We gotta go to, join, to our questions, but just a quick reminder of abduction and adduction, what that looks like. Abduction is away from the midline of the body. Adduction is towards the midline of the body. And in this example, she's a cheerleader or a soccer player or whatever, um, she's kicking a ball. Um, but that adduction came from the abduction position, but sort of, so from that outward position through the midline of the body, and that's still considered adduction. Great work. All right. I kind of went off on a few examples, so we're running a little longer than normal, but we only have four questions. So let's go dissect some questions. Taking what we've just learned, let's apply it. And as a reminder, our test taking strategy for dissecting questions is to fully understand the question, eliminate a wrong answer, and choose the best answer. If you can eliminate more than one wrong answer, even better. Let's move through. Huh. What is the scapulothoracic joint? What is the scapulothoracic joint? A, it's also called the shoulder joint. It's a ball and socket joint. B, it's where the scapula meets the collarbone. C, where the thoracic spine meets the ribs, the joints between the ribs and the vertebrae. So it's where the thoracic spine meets the ribs, the joints between the ribs and the vertebrae. D, not a true anatomical joint. Can you eliminate one wrong answer? I see the answers coming in. Let's see. So the scapulothoracic joint. A, let's, let's eliminate one wrong answer as we review these answers. Be careful of distractors. Look at this question. What do you recognize in the question? You see two root words that you recognize, maybe? Maybe one root word you recognize? Let's use that as clues. A, so what is the scapulothoracic joint? A, it's also called the shoulder joint. It's a ball and socket joint. B, it's where the scapula meets the collarbone. C, where the thoracic spine meets the ribs, so it's the joints between the ribs and the vertebrae. D, it's not a true anatomical joint. We're gonna eliminate a wrong answer. Actually, this time around, it wouldn't let me eliminate wrong answers without doing something funky. So we're gonna see the true answer. Ready? Oh, we have a whole bunch of, yeah, let's see. Oh. I love where you went with this, but you'll be surprised to see the best answer is it's not a true anatomical joint. 
what is the shoulder joint? What's the anatomical name of the shoulder joint? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I know. Sandra says she was scared to put letter D. I know. It's like one of those other ones has to be right there. So like, there's so many details. Yeah. The shoulder joint is the gleno. Thank you, Melissa. Yes, it is, right? So the shoulder joint is the glenohumeral joint. Humerus has to be in there. Let's take a look. I gave you, I gave you a little bit of a description here. So it's not a true anatomical joint. Normally, it's located between the seventh, second and the seventh rib. This is the shoulder blade gliding against the ribs. This is why I'm pointing it out to you because if you see it on the emblex, don't be confused, be clear. Scapulo, scapula, thoracic. Who even knew this was a joint, right? It's a region as well. The thoracic region is really the name of it. It's not a region. Um, you might have a someone refer to the scapular region, but the scapular thoracic joint just really refers to how the scapula glides along the ribs. Another picture of it here. So the scapula gliding along those ribs is called the scapula thoracic joint. It's not a real joint. It's just the, it's not even a gliding joint. And I probably shouldn't be using gliding. It, 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 it slides, it slides along the rib cage there. So, just so you know, learn something today. All right. The glenohumeral joint. The glenohumeral joint is a very loose ball and socket. What muscles reinforce the stability of that joint? So the shoulder joint is a very loose ball and socket. We heard that some muscles reinforce the stability of that joint. Answers. A, it's reinforced by the rotator cuff, the pec major and the teres major. B, it's reinforced by the latissimus dorsi and the levator scap. C, it's reinforced by the deltoid muscle group, anterior, medial and lateral. D, it's reinforced by the levator scapula and just the posterior deltoid. Okay, these questions are meant to be like, it's like a blender goes off in your brain. It's like, holy mackerel. This is hard. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. I'm giving you some hard questions because they simulate the ones you'll see on the emblex. This would be a difficult question. So if you're getting this question, that's actually good news because that means you've done really well in this category. But let's eliminate a wrong answer. Ooh, okay, let's see. Vanessa says C is wrong. Hmm, let's eliminate a wrong answer. I agree with you, Vanessa, but also letter D is wrong because we're talking about the shoulder joint, right? Latissimus dorsi is involved in movement, but it doesn't actually reinforce the loose ball and socket. When it, lats are involved in the movement, as is the levator scapula. It's involved in movement, right? But the question is, what reinforces the stability of that joint? The other answers coming in. And the correct answer is Pumla had it. Yeah. Letter A, Tanya got it. Yes. Vanessa got it. Ooh, Sandra got it. Yeah. I know it's a tough one because Terry's major, right? You know, Peck is involved. Yeah, Peck's involved. But we know the rotator cuffs are involved. The rotator cuffs 
the reason there's so many silly injuries to those silly rotator cuffs, those wonderful rotator cuffs, is because they, they are the major stabilizing force for the joint, for the shoulder joint, the glenohumeral joint. Pec major, Mary's major, that might have been out from my left field, but best answer, letter A. So the glenohumeral joint is reinforced by the rotator cuffs, pec major, and teres major. Oh, I'm giving you some tough ones today. Oi, oi, oi. All right. The front of the body, best answer. Remember, and I'm giving you a clue by saying best answer. The front of the body is known as a, the posterior, B, the anterior or ventral and ventral part, the C, the anterior, D, the anterior and dorsal part. Guys are all getting it. I'm gonna eliminate a wrong answer. We know it's not the posterior. And this seems to have landed with you guys. Letter B is the best answer, anterior and or ventral part. So that front of the body is considered the anterior or the ventral part. Last question. In Western anatomical position, the human body is, pick your best answer. Go ahead, read through them. We'll simulate the emblex, because you're not gonna have somebody reading you the questions. Ooh, I see some answers. Be careful. I'm gonna go ahead and eliminate one wrong answer. This could be the one you eliminate right away. Not this one, right? Not letter A because bent elbow. No bent elbow in anatomical position. So you got B, C, or D. Go ahead and go through the motions. We're 50-50 on these answers. I don't know if you see these coming in. Ah, okay, okay, good. Good, 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 good. good. All right, the best answer. Boom, ba boom. Letter D. Wait, why isn't it B? Arms straight out. Arms straight out. Arms at side. Mm hmm. Gotta go through those motions. All right, let's see, let's see, let's see. <laughs> Queenie, you be careful. All right. Yes, good, good, good. I see you got to letter D, yes. Sandra, Tanya, Cami, Vanessa, yes. Queenie, yes. Yes, you're so gonna ace the emblex, yay. I know, because you go through these hard questions, right? That's all folks. <laughs> yeah, I should have the, the cartoon music. Dun, 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 dun. That's all folks. Um, yes. And so that is all for right now. Uh, I'll go ahead and wind up uh, the recording. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, this is the MBLEX Review Course. We are preparing you. I, my name is Jody Scholes, and I am helping you to prepare to calmly and confidently pass the massage and bodywork licensing exam. We are super focused on having this result and we pause for just a moment to think about being a licensed massage therapist. Everybody in this room right now, everybody listening, you're all on the journey. You're all on the journey and you're, you've gathered here together. We've got this momentum. Think now, think now about how it's gonna feel to be going to work to go do massages. Think about seeing pass on that piece of paper. 
and let's raise the vibration, raise our awareness, raise our, if you will, allow me, the collective consciousness and just bring forth this vision that each of you have. I'm calling it forth into expression today, now. And so it is. So I'll sign off for now on the recording, but I'll be here for a few more minutes to answer your specific questions uh, that you may have had about the material, about the test taking process, uh, or about other questions on the practice exams. Signing off for now. See you again real soon.